Okay. We're going to start. This week's Parsha is Parsha Shlach, a very famous uh, Parsha that deals with the Miraglum, it deals with the spies. But as simple as the story sounds, it's a very complicated story. And the truth of the matter is, honestly, without the interpretation, the way Hasidus explains it, it's very, very difficult to really understand properly the story of the Miraglim. Everybody knows the story. Meshe Rabbeinu sends five stars to Israel. Hashem says to him, listen, I'm not telling you to do it. You want to do it? Okay, send spies to Israel. I'm not telling you to do it. Spies come back, and Meshe Rabbeinu says to them, I want you to tell me exactly what's going on. Is it weak? Is it strong? Is it loud? Is it good? Is it bad? Give me a total report and bring back from the fruits of the land. So the Meraglim go 40 days, 40 nights, they come back and they bring these massive fruits from Eretz Yisrael and the Meraglim, as everybody knows the story, come back and they say, there's no way we can conquer the land. It's impossible, uh, forget it. Even the Kaviyoch Hashem himself can't do it. Yeshua and Kali were the only guys that were good. Meshe Rabbeinu beforehand, Prayed for Yehoshua. He added the name from Hoshea ben Nun to Yehoshua ben Nun. He added the Yud. And he said, he davened and he said, Hashem should save you from the hands of the Miraglims. Okay? And because of that, the Jews ended up in the desert for 40 years. That's the simple story. Okay? I'm going to ask now um, eight questions. <laughs> I'm going to ask eight questions. And then we're going to blend everything together, hopefully, and answer all the issues and explain the real story of the Miraglim, the way it's interpreted by the Alter Rebbe and Chsidis and so on. Number one, first basic question is, Hashem says to Meshe Rabbeinu, you don't have to send spies. The Jews are going to conquer the land. They, they're not, they don't need them to, to send spies. Meshe Rabbeinu says, okay, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it. Hashem agreed. He didn't go against Hashem. But the question is, Meshe Rabbeinu was this great tzaddik. If he knew Hashem didn't want him to send spies, why did he? He should have told the Jews, you know what? Hashem said, we don't need it, and I'm not doing it. So Meshe Rabbeinu sends the spies, even though he knows Hashem is not interested in doing it. He's not punished for it, by the way. Nowhere is Meshe Rabbeinu punished for the story of the spies, but why did he send the spies if nobody, if Hashem told him no? Number two, Hashem says no, and then Hashem says, okay, I agree, send the spies. I mean, it's like Hashem's, so to speak, changing his mind to a certain extent. Third thing, Rashi says at the beginning, the first Rashi, Shlach Lecha Anoshim, Rashi says, Shakulam Kshedim Hoyu. They were all tzaddikim. You can imagine if Meshe Rabbeinu picked them, they were tzaddikim, very great tzaddikim. From the entire Jewish nation, who did Meshe Rabbeinu pick? Meshe Rabbeinu picked these 12. So obviously they were great tzaddikim. And Rashi says, At the time he sent them, they were kosher people, they were tzaddikim. So why did they sin? Why did they change their mind and come back with such terrible lush and hearted, terrible, evil things about Eretz So Why did they do that? Another thing, if you think about the story, it, it's a joke. The Miraglim said, we don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. That's what they said, we don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. What was the punishment? They're going to stay longer in the desert. That's exactly what they wanted. Think about it. The Miraglim said, we don't want to go on Tayyip Yisrael. We want to stay in the desert. So what's the punishment? Staying 40 years in the desert. What type of punishment is that? That's exactly what they wanted. Another question. We find everybody brought back fruits. And Rashi says in the Gemara in Saita that Yeshua and Kalev did not bring back any fruits. And the Gemara says two reasons. One is because they were prominent, so it was below their dignity for them to be schlepping back fruits. 
And another thing the Gemara says, and that's what Rashi says, why didn't Yeshua and Kali bring back fruit? Because the Jews, the Miraglim, brought back fruit. They brought, the reason they brought back the fruit, Yom Moshe Rabbeinu told them. But they wanted, when they brought back the fruits, to show, just like the fruits are freakish sized, the same thing, there's old giants there. They wanted to show, just like the fruits are strange, overgrown, the people are overgrown. So, but the problem was, Meshe Rabbeinu told them to bring back fruits. Why didn't Yeshua and Kali bring back fruits? Meshe Rabbeinu told them to bring back fruits. Another interesting Shailam. We know in Yiddishkeit, a minion is 10 people. A minion is 10 people. Where do we learn out 10 people from? From the Meraglim. The Torah calls the Meraglim Eido, the community. And this week's Pasha. The Meraglim are called Eido community. So a community is how many Meraglim were there? The negative Meraglim were 10 people. So therefore the Gemara says, and Halacha says, where do we learn out that a minion is 10 people? From the fact that there were 10 spies. So the Rebbe asks, a lot of Mephoshim ask, there's no better place to learn out a minion than from 10 bad people? The Meraglim came back and sinned. Wasn't there a better place to learn out the minion? The only place is from the Meraglim? It doesn't make sense. Another question. And we'll stop with this. With, we ask this question, and then we'll explain the whole thing. And that is, um, why didn't Meshe Rabbeinu daven for all the spies? The Pasik says, Meshe Rabbeinu davened for Yahushua. That Yahushua should come back with, uh, that he should be saved. The question is, why didn't Meshe Rabbeinu daven for Kalev? Why didn't Meshe Rabbeinu daven for all these spies? He should have davened for every, why only for Yahushua? Again, it doesn't make sense. If he's davening for Yahushua, daven for everybody already. Next issue is a general question. What do we learn from all this? Every story in Torah is a lesson. What is the purpose and what can we learn from this whole story of the Mirabu? Okay, so let's discuss the real story of the Mirabu. The Jews were in the desert. The Jews in the desert had the Mon from heaven. They had the well, which was, by the way, not only did they drink from it, there was their mikvah, there was, everybody drank from it, the animals drank from it, everybody had water from the well, Miriam's well. They had built-in air conditioning because the clouds took away the sun, the clouds got rid of everything, all the dangerous things on the way, and, and the clouds were very good. What did the Jews have to do a whole day? They didn't have to work for a living. They didn't have to go get to draw water from the well. They didn't have to fan themselves with air conditioning. Everything was there from Hashem. Torah was given in the Midbar. Now Hashem says, guess what, guys? You have to go into Eretz Yisrael. What's going to happen when you come into Eretz Yisrael? No more mon. No more well, no more clouds. What do you have to start doing? You're going to have to start working for a living. The Miragam, who is these great tzaddikim, said, one minute. We're going to go into Eretz Yisrael. We're not going to be able to learn Torah anymore. We're going to be busy making a living. If we're going to be busy making a living, how in the world can we go and, and learn Torah? So the Miraglim came along and they said, we don't want to go on Tarek Yisrael. What did they do? They came back and they spoke seemingly negative about Tarek Yisrael. But the truth is, that was not their sin. 
they spoke exactly, they answered Moshe Rabbeinu's questions. Moshe Rabbeinu told them, I want you to see Hachazeku Ad Alpha, is it strong or weak? Are the cities fortified? What's the story of the people there? Is it fertile land? They came back and they said exactly what the story is. And they brought back fruit, exactly like Moshe Rabbeinu. What does he want from them? The problem is the Miraglim added one word that caused the problem. Hashem told Meshe Rabbeinu. Meshe Rabbeinu was told by Hashem, you know what, I don't want to send spies. Because we, I know he could do it. The spies came back and they said the truth. But Meshe Rabbeinu didn't tell them to see if we could conquer the land. Meshe Rabbeinu said to them, I want you to find out how to conquer the land. I don't want you to see if we could do it. I want you to see how we do it. And the sin of the Miraglim was, they came back, and this nobody told them to do. The only sin of the Miraglim was that they said, Hashem, Kaviyoch, even God himself, and Yochel Lehetzi as Caleb, God himself can't even conquer the land. How can they say such a thing? How can the Miragum Tzaddikim say such a thing? Because the Miragum understood the following. And they, they were wrong. It was a terrible mistake. But let me tell you what the sin of the Miragum was. The Miragum misunderstood the fact that if Hashem wants the Jews to go into Eretz Yisrael, they're able to overcome the difficulties of Eretz Yisrael, and they can create a Torah environment, a Yiddish environment, Dafke in Eretz Yisrael. That's what Hashem wanted. The Miraglim said, we have to lock ourselves up in the ghetto. Let's lock ourselves up in the ghetto. Let's not go out into the world. Let's segregate ourselves from the world. The world will corrupt us. Hashem said, uh-uh, that's not what I want. Because the Miraglim said, and this is a very interesting thing the Rebbe explains. The Rebbe says, there's two types of tzaddikim. There's two types of tzaddikim. There are tzaddikim, like we know even today, many tzaddikim are tzaddikim for themselves. You know, they're locked up. They're not interested in dealing with the world. They separate themselves from the world. They learn, I don't want to use, I'm not, God forbid, speaking that. They learn in a kernel, they learn in a yeshiva. And they say, let's separate ourselves from the world because the world will corrupt us. You know, it's the same thing you have to go off for a second. Many people say, let's get rid of the internet. Let's get rid of everything, all these things, because look what it's doing. That, that was the sin of the Miraglim, by the way. What Hashem wants, that you take, at its Yisrael, you take the giants of evil, meaning very powerful forces of evil, and over there the Jew has the ability to create an environment of Torah mitzvahs. Hashem says, it's no trick to be good in the desert, to learn trade in the desert and keep mitzvahs in the desert. What's the big deal? Do you have anything else to do? <laughs> there's nothing else you could do. What else are you going to do? There's no movies. There's no internet. There's no, thank God, everybody's uh, phones were down today. It's a day of uh, menucha, a day of rest. But well, why, why? So uh, Hashem said, there's two types of tzaddikim. The Miraglim, the Miraglim, they were of the opinion, lock yourselves up in the ghetto. Let's stay in the Midbar. Yeshua, who was going to be the leader, that was going to take the Jews in Tarot Yisrael, that is a different type of a person. He is a Nasi, a lead Jewish leader, that knows that Hashem doesn't want us to lock ourselves up from the world. 
Hashem wants us to be in the world. And in fact, that was the difference between Rabbi Shimba Yechai and Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi Shimba Yechai was, so to speak, locked up in a cave. Rabbi Shimba Yechai was Nasi. He didn't do anything else but learning. And Rabbi Shimba Yechai said, how can you leave Taira and work in the field? You can't do that. And the Gemara says a lot of people tried Rabbi Shimba Yechai's way. It didn't work. Rabbi Shmuel, on the other hand, was a Kain Gadol. Rabbi Shmo, on the other hand, said, Hanig Bahem Minig Together with Taira, you need to have world. Don't separate yourself from the world. You need to be together with the world. So therefore, what did Meshe Rabbeinu want from sending the spies? Meshe Rabbeinu said like this, it's a given that if Hashem wants to do it, he could do it. That's a given. What does Meish Rabbeinu want? That the Jews should understand this on their own. You know, it's Nasa Venishma. Hashem says, guys, I'm going to take you into Eretz Yisro. You're going to conquer the land. You're going to go into Eretz Yisro. You could do it. Of course, Meish Rabbeinu believed in Hashem. The Jews are Maminim B'nei Maminim. They also believe in Hashem. But what Meish Rabbeinu wanted to do was that the Jews should understand this on their own. That they should see it physically, that they have the ability to conquer the land. The problem with the Miraglim was, the Rebbe explains, the problem with the Miraglim was, they only relied on their Seichel, and therefore they forgot the Kabbalah. So they refit on the Nishma, they forgot the Nasa. They forgot that Hashem is able to do it regardless, and a Jew could overcome the difficulties of the world. And in passing, there's a very interesting Pasik. It says, we felt, the Maragum came back, and they said, a lot of rabbis use this in speeches, but it's a very important thing. The Maragum came back, and they said, we were, we were felt the like grasshoppers, we felt like grasshoppers. And then the Pasuk says, hoyinu so we were in their eyes. Listen to this. The Maragun came back and said, we felt like grasshoppers compared to them. And so we were in their eyes. And all the Bali Musa and all their rabbis in their speeches, when they speak about Jewish pride, the way a Jew thinks of himself is the way others are going to think of you. If you think you're a grasshopper, if you're a, you think you're a nothing, and so will people think of you the same way. If you don't have Jewish pride, the Goyim will look down at you. If you don't have pride in your Yiddishkeit, in your Torah mitzvahs, then other people will look down at you. The way you think of yourself that's the way other people will think of you. And that's just the Derech Agav. And he, coming back to this point. So the Meraglim didn't want to go into Eretz Yisrael. They wanted to stay in the Midbar. And we said, why? Because they said, we need to seclude ourselves in the Midbar, and therefore we'll be able to keep Torah Mitzvahs properly. So the Rebbe explains, that's why we learn out a minion from the Meraglim. What was the Miraglim's approach? Let's stay in the desert. Let's be in a cocoon. Let's stay in this ghetto. Let's be away from the world to be able to keep Torah mitzvahs. But nevertheless, when the Jew is davening, at the time they're davening, at the time they're learning, they really should be secluded from the world. We mentioned this in a previous class about by Matan Torah. Torah is given on Shabbos because when a person learns Torah, a person davens. At that moment, it's Shabbos. There is no phone. There is no world. There's only the Jew davening and learning. And therefore, the Rebbe explains, why do we learn out the minion from the Meraglim? Because the Meraglim had a positive side to them. Seclude yourself from the world to be able to observe Torah mitzvahs. The problem with that, and, and they, the worst thing was, they said it's impossible 
for a Jew to be in the world and do it. That's what they said. A Jew cannot be in the world. We cannot go into Eretz Yisrael, be involved in worldly affairs, and keep Torah mitzvahs. What did Hashem say? That's the mistake. That's not what I created the world for. I created the world for Dira B'Tachtainu, like we learned many times. Hashem says, I don't want you staying in the yeshiva all your life. For that matter, in Chabad philosophy, Hashem doesn't want us to stay in Kerala the whole life. Hashem says, go out into the world where there are giants, where there are super evil forces, and over there, create an environment of Torah mitzvahs. Don't come along and say, I can't be a religious Jew in the world. I can't be a religious Jew in business. That's what a lot of people say. Okay, in sure I can be religious. In business, how can I be? That's exactly what the Meraglim wanted. The Meraglim said, you cannot be a religious Jew in Eretz Yisrael, in world, where there are powerful giants, powerful forces of evil that want to destroy the Jew. It's impossible for a Jew to be religious. That was exactly the sin of the Meraglim. The Meraglim said, you can't do it. And Hashem said you could. Okay, so there, yes, there are tzaddikim, that that is their style. But, Moshe Rabbeinu gave the bracha to Yeshua because Yeshua was a future leader. And a future leader has to have that ability to have the bracha that Hashem should save him from the idea of the spies. Now, why didn't he daven for Kali? Kali wasn't the leader. Kali did not become a leader of the Jewish people. But Kaliv on his own understood that he had to go to Hebron to Kivrei Ovis. He understood he had to go to Hebron to Davin by Mercy Machpelah that the Ovid should help him and be the great uh, a person that he was not to be hurt by the Meragun. But Meish Rabbeinu said, their tzaddikim, that's their style. Good. But that's not what Hashem really wants. Hashem wants a tzaddik that could be involved in the world. Okay, next. It's also part of this. So therefore, why did Kalev and Yeshua not bring back fruits that Meshul Rabbeinu told him to bring back fruits? Because, in fact, the Rebbe has a whole long sikh about this. I, I'm not going to go into the whole sikha. But the Rebbe discusses, there's two ways of looking at Meshul Rabbeinu's request. One way of looking at the request is, fruits have to be brought back. Whoever does it, does it. That's it. It could be anybody else. Another way of looking at it is, you're sure everybody, all 12 of them had to bring back fruits. Well, Meish Rabbeinu, just look at the passage. Meish Rabbeinu sent them to Israel. He said, bring back fruits. They can look at it two ways. Does everybody have to bring back a fruit? Or the fruits have to be back? If five people bring back fruits, it's okay. The Rebbe says, Rashi learns, like the second opinion of the Gemara, that the reason why they didn't bring back fruits was not because they were prominent people. And if they were prominent people, they didn't have to personally bring back fruits because the other people were bringing back fruits. There was a personal obligation on Yeshua and Kalev to bring back fruits. Why didn't they? They said, very simple. Meisha Rabbeinu told us to bring back fruits to prove how fertile and how good the land was but the Meraglim didn't bring back fruits for that. They brought back fruits for a negative reason. To show that just like the fruits are crazy, the people are crazy big and strong. So Yeshua and Kalev said, yeah, we have an obligation to bring back fruits. But they already proved that it's negativity. And there it's an Aveda. And therefore, Quanta Allah Rabbis explains, Yeshua and Kalev were not allowed to bring back fruits because it would be contradictory to the mission that Meshe Rabbeinu gave them to bring back the fruits. And therefore they didn't do it. Okay, now therefore we find another interesting expression. When Meshe Rabbeinu, Hashem wanted to destroy the Jewish people. So in the Pash it says that... Um, Meshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, what's going to happen? That the Jews are going to, you're going to destroy the Jews. Okay? And he says, 
Vayishchotem Bamidbar. You're going to shech them in the desert. That's what the Patsik says. Okay? They're going to say, uh, the people are going to say, Vayishchotem Bamidbar, Hashem shechted the Jews in the Midbar. Meaning he wiped them out. What type of expression is this? He shechted them in the Midbar. I mean, say you, the people would say you killed the Jews out in the desert. Why in the world is the Pasuk using the expression by Yeshchotim by Midbar, you shechted them in the Midbar? So the Rebbe explains very beautifully. Ask somebody, what is Shechita? If you ask somebody, what is Shechita? They're not going to tell you, I'm killing the animal. You're telling a person, I'm making it kosher to eat. Shechit is just not a killing of an animal. That's killing. What is shechit? Shechit is preparing the animal to be elevated, to be utilized and eaten by a Jew. Meish Rabbeinu said to God, you're going to keep the Jews in the midbar. You know what the purpose of the midbar is? By yishchotem by midbar. To prepare the Jews to go into Eretz Yisrael. In other words, the punishment of staying in the Midbar was not a punishment. The punishment was that none of them went into Eretz Yisrael, that they all died. That was the punishment. What was the fact that they stayed in the desert 40 years? That wasn't the punishment. That was to prepare the Jews to be able to go into Eretz Yisrael. And for that, they needed 40-year preparation to undo the 40 days that the Meraglim sinned. And therefore, Hashem said, you're going to stay in the Midbar 40 years. For what purpose? By Yishchotem, by Midbar, to be shechted, so to speak, to prepare themselves to be able to go into the Midbar. That's what Hashem wanted from from the from the story of the, from the from that aspect of the of the miraglim. Okay, therefore, we find another interesting thing in the whole story of the miraglim. Another remarkable concept. Again, Hashem says to Meish I don't want. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm not commanding you to bring him to take uh, to send spies. Meish Rabbeinu did it anyway. And we asked the question before, the famous question, so why did Meish Rabbeinu send them? Okay, so let's go off a little bit to understand a very, very interesting difference between the Haftarah today and the, and the Parsha of Shlach. The Haftarah Parsha of Shlach is the story of Yeshua sending two Meraglim. Okay, to Eretz Yisrael. They ended up in the house of Rachav Azaina, which by the way, the Mepharshim say Zaina doesn't mean a prostitute. It means a business lady from the word Zon. Mepharshim, Zon Mepharshim, she wasn't a prostitute, the Mepharshim say. She was actually a, a businesswoman that had a food business. And the whole story, they came back and she put them up in the attic and she hit, the, hit them and it was a remarkable story. And they came back with positive reports. Okay? So now the question is like this. Why were Meshe Rabbeinu's spies a failure? And Yeshua's spies were very, very successful. So there's a beautiful Maimer from the Rebbe. Mugat, the edited Maimer from the Rebbe. And the Rebbe explains the following. And this gives a whole insight to the whole in why Hashem says, I'm not commanding you to do it, and Meish Rabbeinu did it anyway. The seven nations of Canaan that the Jews conquered represents the seven bad Midas of the Nefesh Habamis. We learned in Chassidus, we're learning that now in Tanya. Right, Wednesday night, we learned the seven bad Midas and the seven bad leaders of the Nefesh Abamis. That is represented by the seven bad nations of Eretz Yisrael, the seven nations that had to be destroyed. 
In Tadi and Al Trevor is going to explain only a tzaddik who's born a tzaddik has the ability to kill the Yetzirah to get rid and destroy the seven Midas, the seven bad Midas. Only a tzaddik Gomor has the ability to transform it to Kedusha. A normal person, i.e. the Bainani, that we're learning about, we will learn the Mitzvah Shem later on in Prakim of Tanya. The Bainani is one who does not conquer the Eight Sahara. He can't conquer the Eight Sahara. You have to be born to heat Sadiq, you have to be born with that ability to kill your Eight Sahara. A normal person, a Bainani, that he cannot do it. A Bainani, we mentioned, we didn't get there yet, but we learned in Tanya. A Bainani is somebody who doesn't sin at all. Not in thought, not in speech, and not in action. Why isn't he a tzaddik? Because he still has a Yetzirah. And this Yetzirah is constantly pumping in evil into the person. But the person, the Bainani, the second an evil thought comes into his mind, he gets rid of it by thinking of the thought. Second, he wants to speak something bad. He doesn't do it. He closes his mouth. Second, he wants to do something bad. He has the impulses to do it, but he doesn't do it. A Bainani could control thought, speech, and action. A Bainani cannot control the Nefesh Abahamis. He cannot conquer the seven Midas of the Nefesh Abahamis of the animal soul. That's impossible for anybody to do except the Tzaddik. So the Al-Trab explains in, in Tanya, so why does it take to heat Tzaddik? So why does the, why is the, the Shama given the oath to heat Tzaddik? If you can't. If you can't be a tzaddik, why is the neshama given that oath to be, ability to be a tzaddik? So the Al-Trebbe says in Tanya, listen, you can't do it, but try. You have to try to do it. You have to try to kill your Yetzirah. You have to try. You're not going to be successful, probably. And the Al-Trebbe says in Tanya that if the person tries hard enough, even though they cannot be a tzaddik because they're not born with that ability. But if a person is, tries hard and hard and hard to do it, Hashem will give him the neshama of a different tzaddik, what's called in the level of ebor, a pregnancy, and he will then be able to overcome those difficulties. He would be able to do it. But can the person do it? No. Thought, speech, and action, that you could do. And if you could, you have to do it. So let's understand what's going on. Meshe Rabbeinu and Yeshua. The Medri says, Yeshua sent the spies to Yerichai, the city of Yerichai. Yerichai was the first city they conquered in Eretz Yisrael. When the walls came tumbling down, and the Ramam says it was on Shabbos. Now, Chassidus explains that Yerichai comes from the word reach, smell. Chassidus, I don't want to elaborate on this now, but Chassidus explains that the three garments of thought, speech, and action, thought, speech, and action are called reach, smell. Whatever, Yericho represents thought, speech, and action. Thought, speech, and action, every Jew could do. Can we conquer the seven Midas, the seven bad Midas? No, we can't. Not every person could do it. But we have to try. So let's go back now to the beginning of the Parsha. Hashem is sending spies to Eretz Yisrael to conquer the seven nations. 
the spice to open up the path to do it. Hashem says to Meshav Rabbeinu, I can't command that because if I can command it, that means they could do it, but they can't do it. You have to be born with the ability to do it. So you can't do it. So Hashem says, Ani einem et sava eisach. I can't command. The Rebbe explains it's so beautiful. The Rebbe says, Hashem says, I can't command you to send spies because the fact that I command you to do it means you could do it. But that's not reality. What does Meisha Rabbeinu say? Meisha Rabbeinu, the great tzaddik. Meisha Rabbeinu, the great Jew lover. Meisha Rabbeinu looks at the potential of every single Jew. The Drebbe did. He looks at the potential and says, you could do above and beyond what you think you could do. So Meisha Rabbeinu says, I'm going to tell them to do it anyway. I'm not going against Hashem. Hashem says, I can't command you to send spies because they can't necessarily overcome it. If I give you a mitzvah, that means you have to be able to do it. If you're not able to do it, I cannot command you to do it. It's hypocritical. But Meisha Rabbeinu, the Nasi Hadar, Meisha Rabbeinu says, Shlach Lucha Anoshim, Hashem says, Meisha Rabbeinu, you can send spies. Why? Because I want you to try to convince them to kill the Yetzirah, to kill the seven nations. Yeshua spies, that wasn't to conquer the seven nations. That was to conquer the city of Yericho. Reach, the garments, Hashem said that you could do. And therefore Yeshua told them, and they were successful. The Miraglim weren't successful, you can't blame them. Because they couldn't do it. And therefore Hashem didn't command them to do it. So what is the lesson from all of this? Let's learn a, le- a practical lesson from the story of the Miraglim. The practical lesson from the story of the Miraglim for you and I is very simple. Shlach means a shliach. Okay? Every Jew is a shliach of Hashem. What is the job of the shliach of the Jew? Shlach lecho anoshim. Every Jew is given a mission. What is the mission? To realize one thing. Not if I could be a religious Jew in the world. The mission of every Jew, and this is the, mo- the, the notion that everybody has to keep in mind. The notion that everybody has to keep in mind is very simple. We are going to conquer the land. We are going to conquer Eretz so We are going to conquer the giants. The giants, again, business world, difficulties, tragedies, complications, tzadahs, you name it. That was Eretz, they came back with those unbelievable giants. What do you want us to do? Chazakumi men of the Meraglim said, even God can't do that. Which was a very big sin on that point, part. But the sin of the Meraglim was one point. Meish Rabbeinu said, we're doing it. All you need to do is figure out how. Once you come along and say, let me see if I could do it, you know what? Go to sleep. At least don't get in the way. Hashem says to every Jew, Shlach Luchana, you have a shlichus. Every Jew has a, a mission. The mission to accomplish is that we are going to conquer Eretz Yisrael. And Hashem says, I want, I'm sending Meragum, the original story of the Meragum, that they should understand how to do it. They should figure out how to do it. Not if we could do it. You have to go out into the world and figure out, okay, there's a given. 
we are doing it. That's the given. How? Hashem says that you need to spend spies. You need to spend send spies to spy out the land and figure out how we're going to do it. And the same thing, I, I, on a personal note, I can tell you, you know, okay, thank God we were evicted from the show, you know, and from Foothills. Baruch Hashem, we were evicted. Without that, we'd still be there. We are evicted. And then we have this big, way over the head stuff. And we were talking, and we said, listen, what does it ever want us to do? We're doing it. We're doing it. We have to figure out how. But if, God forbid, our attitude would have been, let's see if we could do it, we would be homeless in the streets. We'd have to put up a tent on Moshe Bola in the middle of, I don't know, who knows where. But this is a very important lesson that I've been banged into our heads. Hashem gives every Jew a mission. The neshama comes into the body. That's the neshama going into, into Eretz Yisrael. There's a mission to accomplish. Make a dira b'tachtein and make a dwelling place for Hashem in this world. Hashem says, you can do it. I want you to figure out how to do it. And in fact, the Rebbe many times by the Shluchim Convention spoke a very interesting difference between a shliach, so we say shliach shal adam kamaisai, a shliach of the person, the messenger of the person is like the person himself, versus an evid. The Allah is yad evid ki yad rabbi. The hand of the evid, the hand of the, ma- of the servant is the hand of the master. And the Rebbe explains, what's the difference between a shliach and an evid? Another remarkable concept. Both are connected to the sender. The evid is an extension of the master. The shliach is the extension of the one that sent him, the mashaleach. The Rebbe said like this, the purpose of a shliach, and the Rebbe said that many times in the shluchim convention, the Rebbe said the purpose of a shliach is to go to a place with the attitude I'm doing it and figure out how to do it. And Evid doesn't figure. Evid is like a, an ex, a hand. That's it. He does what he's told and that's it. The purpose of a shliach, the Rebbe says, is for the shliach to use his own brain, not like the Miraglim that said we can't, but the purpose of the Miraglim sending was that they should say how we're going to do it. And that's a really remarkable lesson in the attitude of what Meshach Rabbeinu teaches us. Number one, even though you can't do it, Torah says you can't conquer your Yetzirah unless if you're a tzaddik. Torah says, Meshach Rabbeinu says to the Jew, you know what? Even if you think you can't, go anyway. But go with the right attitude. If you go with the right attitude, you'll come back very productive. You come back with a negative attitude, forget it, go to sleep. The Meragum should have gone to sleep, it would have been better. They would have gone straight into Eretz Yisrael instead of spending 40 years in the Midbar. The lesson is very simple. Not if, but how. And that was the lesson of Meragum. And therefore, all the Meragum really were good people. They had a different approach in Yiddishkeit. Lock yourself up in the ghetto. Don't deal with world. World will corrupt you. And Torah comes along, and this is what Pasha Shlach is teaching us. Pasha Shlach is teaching us, no, you got it wrong. Not only will the world not affect you, but you will change the world. You will conquer the world. Figure out how. And the Rebbe said many times, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. The Rebbe said this many times privately to Shluchim in answers. The Rebbe said, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Figure it out yourself. I'm giving you the mission. How? Figure it out yourself. Okay. Um, if there's any questions, don't hesitate to ask a question. If not, I'll move on to a much simpler issue. At the end of the Parsha, the Torah speaks about the Torah speaks about the Parsha of Tzitzis. Okay? Now we know it says in the the mitzvah of tzitzis, um, 
there's no mitzvah in the Torah. There's certain mitzvahs in the Torah that you have to do. Like a man putting on tefillin, you have to do. A uh, woman benching lich, you have to do. Lula vesri, you have to do. I mean, mitzvahs that you have to do. There are other mitzvahs that you don't have to do. But if a scenario comes up, then you have the mitzvah. For instance, there's a mitzvah in the Torah to do shechita. Shecht an animal. There's no mitzvah in the Torah, I have to go shecht an animal. The Torah says, if you want to eat meat, then you need to shecht, shecht an animal. The Torah says there's a mitzvah of mezuzah. You know, which we're learning in the Wednesday night halacha in Tanya class. There's a mitzvah mezuzah. I don't have to buy a house to put up a mezuzah. If I want to live in my car, I want to live in the street. I don't have a mitzvah putting up mezuzah. If you live in a house, you need to put up a mezuzah. The same thing. <laughs> One of the mitzvahs in the Tate is the mitzvah of a get about divorcing a wife. Trust me, there's no mitzvah in the Torah to divorce your wife. On the contrary, the Torah says, if you're separating and you're divorcing, you have to do it with a get. So there are certain mitzvahs that you must do and certain mitzvahs you don't have to do unless if a situation comes up. The mitzvah of tzitzis, by the way, is not a mitzvah that you have to do. Wait until I'm done. The mitzvah of tzitzis is if a man has a four-cornered garment, then they need to put tzitzis on the garment. Do I have to buy a garment that's four corners and put tzitzis on it? No. There's no such biblical obligation. There's not even a rabbinic obligation. Nevertheless, nevertheless, halacha says emphatically, that a person should buy a four-cornered garment, a man, because women are not obligated, because it's a mitzvah connected to time, because at night you don't need to wear tzitzis. I mean, that's also questionable what that means. And therefore, it's only daytime, not nighttime. And therefore, women are not, because it's connected to time, and therefore, women are not obligated in the mitzvah of tzitzis. But a man, the Torah says, you should go out of your way and make sure to buy a four-cornered garment and to put tzitzis on the garment. Why? In fact, the Gemara says, a person that wears tefillin, a person that has a mezuzah, and a person that wears tzitzis, is so to speak guaranteed not to sin. I, <laughs> I most people that sin, we, we free choice is not taken away. But if you want a, 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 a push, a, a zgula, so to speak, a good luck not to, not to sin, you have a kosher mezuzah and you wear tefillin and you wear a tzitzis, you're meticulous in those mitzvahs, you're guaranteed that you won't sin. Yeah, you have free choice, but you're, so to speak, you're guaranteed not to sin. So it so says, why should a person go out of the way? It doesn't say anywhere you have to go out of the way to buy a house, to buy, to put up a mezuzah. It doesn't say anywhere you have to go out of your way to shech the chicken. Why is there this concept? So it says, because tzitzis, reminds us of all the mitzvahs of the Torah. Tzitzis reminds us of all the mitzvahs in the Torah. How does Tzitzis remind us of all the mitzvahs in the Torah? So it says, Rashi brings down on Chumash, at the end of this week's parsha. Tzitzis, Tzadik Yud, Tzadik Yud, Sof, equals 600. Tzadik Yud is 90 and 10, and again, Tzadik Yud is 90 and 10, and Tzadik is 400. And then you have the uh, eight strings on the tzitzis and the five knots and five and eight is 13. So therefore the Pasuk says, or the Isa may say by looking at the tzitzis, it's called mitzvah Hashem, you're going to remember all the mitzvahs of Hashem. But there's another interesting thing. If you look at, well, if you have tzitzis and you look at the tzitzis, there's five knots. But there's what's called the cholius, the wraparound before the nuts. There's five knots, and then you have the wraparound. It's called the cholius. The custom is, how many cholius do we make between the knots? 
So there's five knots, so you have four in between. So you do seven, eight, 11, 13. Okay? You do five, uh, seven, eight, 11, 13. That's how many, if you look at tzitzis, you'll see what I'm talking about. You wrap it around in, in the making of the tzitzis. What is seven, eight, 11, and 13? Yud K, 15, 7 and 8 is 15 is Yud K. And 11, I'm sorry. Um, 7, 8, okay, I'll try to say that in front of me now. Um, but 11 and 13 is 26. Oh, that's what it is. 13 and 11 is, no, 24. And the third, 15. One second, something's wrong over here. Okay, I'll, I'll say it in a second. But anyway, I'll get it in a minute. But there's another interesting thing that Rebbe says in Shkhunar also like this. The five knots, if you look at the, the knots, okay, that is corresponding with the five chumashim. Okay? Now, the four corners correspond with the four corners of the world, which means... Teda needs to influence the four corners of the world. The next is um, the two front sitzes. That explains this. Right? Dr. Rebbe says this in Shkhunar. The two front sitzes, which are the main of the of the all the tzitzis. The two front sitzes is five knots, and five knots is ten knots, is the ten spheres. And the sixteen strings of the two because each one has eight so you have the two front sitzes is eight and eight is 16 so 16 and 10 is 26 which is yud kibafti okay so therefore he said that rebbe says when you hold the tzitzes you should look at the front two tzitzes why because number one you have in, in each one tzitzit, the five chumashim and the four corners of the world. But if you look at the tzitzit, you have the ten knots, which correspond with the Esther Sphiris, the ten attributes. And then you have the uh, 16 chutim, eight and eight. So that equals together yudke vavke. Um, oh, I know what it is. The seven, eight, 11, and 13 equals 39. Right? Seven and eight is 15. 11 and 13. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they are all together it equals 39. That's the numerical value of Hashem Echad. Hashem equals Yud Kevavke is 26. Echad equals 13. So Hashem Echad, so when you make 7, 8, 11, 13, 11, 13 so all together it equals Hashem Echad. And again, that's the way you remember all the mitzvahs of the, of the Torah by looking at uh, Hashem Echad. Okay, that's it for today. Unless if does anybody have any questions? You can take questions. If not, the Mitzvah Shem, Wednesday night. Again, it might start a minute or two late because of the times, but the uh, Mitzvah Shem, Wednesday night, will have Tanya, Halacha and Tanya. And um, that's it for today, I guess. Everybody Thank you, Rabbi. Have a good evening. Good night. Good evening. Thank you very Thank you, Rabbi. much, uh, Thank Rabbi. You. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. No sound.